also in that something lit up inside me. And I'm like, I got to figure out this fat girl running thing because there's something to this. So again, building up the whole process of little steps over and over, it became 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, jumping over into triathlon and now I'm training for Ironman triathlons. Like things that I would have never expected to love, but being in motion is my peace, is my joy. It's where I get to commune with God. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. You may or may not know this about me, but I am a sucker for what I'm going to call health clickbait. You know, you know, the kinds like, oh, eat this and drop five pounds, the best diet for this, drink this and you'll lose weight or what, whatever it is, not necessarily because I think that clickbait is going to work, or I'm interested in it for me, but because I like to see what kind of content is being put out there, that more than likely, I will have to give a differing perspective on to either a friend or a client or just coming out in conversation at some point. Today's guest is one of those stories that don't necessarily make headlines, but deserves all the clicks and all the claps and all the praise. My guest, Stephanie Lueris, lost over 200 pounds by taking one small realistic, some might say simple, step um, after step after step. It's not exciting. It's not sexy. And it probably won't end up in that Apple News headline section that I read so much. But this is the kind of story that needs more attention. Now, Stephanie Lureris is a body positive personal trainer She's also a pastor, a fitness nutrition specialist, an international best-selling author and speaker who empowers people to achieve their fitness and wellness goals, no matter the starting point. She uses the same holistic goal setting model that aided her success in losing those 200 pounds without the use of commercial dieting uh, with her clients. And then she assists them in reaching their dreams and removing the barriers that crop up along the way. Cause you know, we all have have our own little barriers that do crop up. Now, before I bring on Stephanie, I'd like to remind you of just the home base for my book, Your Worthy Body. And the home base is simply yourworthybody.com with no W's. Here you can do things like purchase the audiobook. And yes, there's an option if you don't have an audible subscription. There's a link to the hard copy and ebook on Amazon. And then you can also receive some great bonuses, including my family's favorite on the go breakfast a printable 14 day health and body image devotional and a five minute wake up and warm up video to get you ready for however it is that you love to move your body. Those resources are all free. They're all at that one place. Just head over to yourworthybody.com. There's no W's in front of it to grab yours. Okay, let's bring on Stephanie. Stephanie, welcome to the Graced Health Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Yes, I am super stoked to get into um, your story and uh, just a little bit of your of your journey. Um, so I want to start off here, and I've introduced you a little bit before uh, before we came on, but you are a pastor turned health and wellness professional. So that is quite a pivot. (laughs) Um, you, you say in your bio that you've lost over 200 pounds in this journey. Um, I would love to, I would love for you to tell us about that because that's, that's, that's a big change in a lot of ways. Yes. Well, I'm excited to be able to share my story today from a little bit different perspective because not everybody understands coming at it from that faith journey. Actually, that jump from
from being a pastor to being a health and wellness professional is not so much the pivot that it looks like, but becoming very clear and very deep in who I am meant to serve. Because I know that I'm called to a life of service, but who is it that I'm here to serve? But it all started back when I was the pastor of a church. Uh, My husband and I uh, are both ordained ministers. We work side by side in the ministry. And this is about eight years ago at this point. And I was just unhappy. I was at my largest size ever. I was letting the stress of life get to me. I was not a happy person in any way, shape, or form. The realization that my spiritual life had become very stagnant came next. But the first thing that happened was I was sitting in my office one afternoon I don't know what came over me. I call this my Holy Spirit moment because I just called out into the empty office, empty building and said, you know, I need your help because I don't know what to do, what to change. Like I know diets were not going to be the answer for me. I was put on my first diet at five years old. I have been on every diet under the sun, you name it. I've been there. I've done it. I've gained and lost weight. So a diet wasn't going to solve my problems, but something needed to change. And I, in that moment, when I cried out, didn't even know what it was going to be, but I was surrounded by that comfort that it's okay. I don't have to know. And so over the next couple days, I'm a really goal-driven person, linear thinker. And so in my mind, the first thing comes to me that we're going to cultivate the habit of drinking water. And it was, okay, well, not go and get one of those giant gallon jugs and do the crazy water challenges. It was a six-ounce cup of water and a kitchen timer. Every time the obnoxious bell went off, you go to the other end of the building where the water cooler is, fill it up and come back and repeat over and over, establishing that habit. Then the next thing was, all right, let's cook at home. I was going through the drive-through twice a day. So doesn't matter what I'm going to cook at home, but now we're going to cook at home. Then it became, well, let's start to look at the things that are being prepared. How are they making us feel? What is more edifying for us? Starting to change what we're consuming. Now, at this point, just naturally from these healthy habits and not engaging them in them in before, being sedentary, I was feeling like, okay, feeling better. I've lost some weight. What maybe now's the time for movement. Now, I was very close to losing my mobility in a body 200 pounds heavier. And so in my mind, the only possible thing was walking. All right, walk to the end of the street and back and I want to die. And I did it in flip flops because putting on real shoes would have just been too much work. Then that up and down the street became around the block around the neighborhood and I came to this place where I don't know where this thought came from this was divine but I wonder if I can run now the girl at fake sick in gym class running is a foreign concept to me but there was like a stop sign 50 yards down the road so I'm like all right run to this stop sign again it was that I want to die feeling but Also in that something lit up inside me and I'm like, I got to figure out this fat girl running thing because there's something to this. So again, building up the whole process of little steps over and over, it became 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, jumping over into triathlon and now I'm training for Ironman triathlons, like things that I would have never expected to love. But being in motion is my peace, is my joy. It's where I get to commune with God. And so process, though, it wasn't only the physical changes 
that were taking place. Because I really like to look at the whole person. We have that physical, the movement, the nutrition, all of the mechanics of the body. But we also have our emotional and mental health, and we have our spiritual growth. And for me, that emotional and mental health, I saw the places that needed a little bit of shoring up. I have PTSD. I was not coping with life very well. And so starting to get the supports and things I needed and intentionally practicing the tools I had. The spiritual life, that was the biggest change and really what I credit to be the support in making physical changes, in making emotional changes. It's really humbling as a pastor to sit back and realize your spiritual life is completely stagnant and that all I was doing was the bare minimum to serve my people, to prepare for the Bible studies, to preach on Sunday, to be that support to others. I was not feeding into myself and growing my walk with God. And once that hit me, And I got over the grieving process of it because that was a huge thing for me. It was now great. What can I do to change it in bringing in the accountability and the support and the encouragement to grow in the areas that I needed in my faith to support myself as a whole person growing together? Okay, I, there's a lot of things on there that I want to tease out. <laughs> so let me start with this. This is in no particular order. Um, I, we, you and I are on video, and I'm sure you see me just furiously taking notes over here. I'm curious, so when you realized that your spiritual life had become stagnant, and I think I think that's really common, and often in, in people who are serving others in whatever it is that they do, because you get so focused on the technicalities of that and the, um, the, the things that we, that we need to do to serve others that sometimes we forget to continue to feed into ourselves spiritually. Uh, so thank you for your honesty in that, because I, I think that that is something that I hear um, from other people. And I notice that in myself every now and then as well. And so, so thank you for that. But I'm curious how movement was a catalyst or, or if movement was a catalyst for spiritual growth. Did you find that when you were walking and then running that you connected with God more? Did you have more prayer time? Um, You know, all of the above, like how did that influence it? Because I know, I know my own path with um, in terms of where God meets me uh, Mm -hmm. when I'm moving, but that doesn't mean that that's how it is for everyone. Right. And it's not the same for everyone. Some of us, you know, have that cozy chair in the corner where this is where we commune with God. And, you know, I had these, these little places and things, but I never really had that, that deep place of connection. For some reason, I found that when my body is in motion, especially especially endurance sports, you're in motion for a long time. So when I'm out training, when I'm out racing, I have a captive audience. I'm I'm not racing and training with friends. It's me versus me. First, I have to get through the noise in my head and leave behind everything else. All of the concerns of life and family and work and everything else, lay that aside. And then I'm in that place of perfect clarity to pray, to hear the nudging of the Holy Spirit, to understand what it is, I'm where I'm at, and just find that peace that recharges me, that fills my cup, that helps me to be the person I'm meant to be the other hours of the day. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. You know, it's funny. um, I used to run a lot more. I I walk more. And I, I do, I like I do sprints. And I I like I'm kind of the one of these weird people who really like running fast for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I will say I really miss about running is I feel like there is something chemically in me that just takes me to a different place to receive God. 
to, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the, I, I just don't get that as much walking and I, and that's okay, but mm-hmm. I, I know what you mean. I, I totally, I, you know, I love how you talk about communing with God. Okay. Now I want to, I want to go back to some of the beginning um, steps that you took because what you're describing is what a lot of people, a lot of the balanced and uh, realistic coaches and trainers will recommend yet it is so hard for people when they do that because you want immediate results. You want to feel better immediately. You want to be able to run the 5k next week. You want to be able to be in control of, um, or, you know, or feel good about the foods that you're eating. And, and I, I really applied those that once the uh, six ounces, right on the other side Mm -hmm. and the timer. Um, what a great first, what a great first step. And I'm curious as you kind of went through your, your progression of the, of the choices that you made to take care of yourself better. Did you have a steep learning curve with learning to cook at home? Because that is, that's a lot. Like when you've been going through the fast food or going through the drive through twice a day, every day, like you might not have oregano. (laughs) I mean, you don't have spray olive oil, right? And so I'm just curious what that was like for you because you said it in one or two sentences, but I have to imagine that, that that was a lot like that can be really overwhelming. And I feel like that would be very easy to throw in the towel and say, screw it. I'm just going, I'm just going through the drive through That's where breaking things down to the smallest bits is so important. And like you said, it's not the magic wand. It's not the instant transformation. It's not sexy. We don't, we don't get the, ooh, ah, uh, here, here's my one week results and life is wonderful. That's where support and accountability comes into play to help you see the success and the transformation you're having, because often we see it in hindsight when we are breaking things down so small that it's not, doesn't feel like it's impacting daily life. We don't see it in the here and now. It's in hindsight that we see, look at this huge snowball effect. And like the eating at home thing, it was an adjustment, but it wasn't cleaning out the pantry and stocking it with all these things in one day. It was, let's introduce a new recipe. Let's experiment a little. Let's buy this instead of that. And over weeks and months, that was that transformation of what the food looked like. For me, I'm I'm a baker. So like the a lot of the recipes and things were really experimental and some were not good. There were some nights where it was just salad for dinner because dinner didn't (laughs) come out. My husband actually is a culinary trained chef. And so he taught me a lot of the different skills and things that I've needed in the kitchen because he doesn't really have the interest in cooking the meals, but he was able to show me those skills that I needed and be willing to experiment a little bit. And I think just having that support, because for me, I grew up with casseroles and pasta every night, like the really quick meals to use fresh ingredients, to use fresh produce, to use different meats was not something that I was really accustomed to in the kitchen. Yeah. I love that word experiment. I did back when I was doing blogging posts or blogs more regularly. I did a whole post on it because I think there is so much power and freedom in an experiment because Mm -hmm. it might work and it might not. And that's why we call it an experiment. And then that way you don't feel that whatever negative emotion it is, right? Like either you don't feel shame because it was a flop or you don't feel like you didn't meet whatever the goal was because it's an experiment and and it may not work. Okay. So you've talked about accountability uh, a couple times already. I'm curious at, in, during your beginning days, where did you find accountability? Because that is a very special person. Sometimes you got to have someone who will, who will keep you to that, but also who will also be encouraging, who will give you grace along the way. And then, uh, 
talk to us some as well about why you feel so, so strongly about accountability. Accountability first is the cornerstone of success. Without it, we don't have that structure to continue moving forward if we don't have that natural discipline built inside of us. And accountability in my book is not one place. It's the people and the structures and the programs that are there for our success. There are a lot of different ways that I have introduced and maintain accountability in my life. The very first people that I brought in when I saw, ooh, some changes need to happen here, it was that spiritual counsel. I, I'm blessed in that being a pastor, I was, I actually still am part of our ministerial association. And so I had wise counsel. I had those people that understood who I was and what I did and could give me the push that I needed in that area to grow, to get outside of myself so that I could be feeding myself. Also that, you know, when I talk about that emotional and spiritual journey, it was finding other people that were experiencing the same thing and consciously doing the work to change it. For me, it, the first place was a book club of other Christian women that knew they had stuff in their life. We showed up every week and hashed it all out. Now, later down the line, it, it also became my triathlon coach, my sports dietitian, all of those people that feed into the different ways that keep me moving forward, that keep me on that road to success and where I want to be. But there isn't one place that accountability is lives, and it looks different for all of us because we all move forward in different ways. So we might need encouragement or that little tap on the shoulder, or we may need not even have the resources and know where to go. And so that's why different looks to accountability is so important so that we get that full support structure that we need. I think that's really wise that we don't look forward in one place or the other thing I'm hearing you say is one person, because that's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure. And that's a lot of stock in one area that maybe we need to have, um, we need to glean into the wisdom and the experiences of other people in order to help help us move along. Because like, I, I have an accountant who helps me with my taxes, and I have a pastor who helps me with my heart. And I'm not going to go to my pastor and ask him to do my account, you know, like my, my year in taxes and vice versa. So, you know, I think tuning into those, to the people who can meet us where we need in those areas are really important. Absolutely. So on that same thread of accountability, we have this as women, and I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me and other conversations that I've had. Sometimes we have one tool and one place where we have accountability. And that is the scale that simply measures our gravitational pull toward the earth. <laughs> but that is the one thing where people would want to stay accountable. So talk to me about how you coach your clients in, in having accountability with them and being, and being a support system, but without saying but without tying that back to the scale. Oh, that is, that's the best topic. And I beg people, put the scale away, get yeah. rid of it. It is unnecessary. You will have amazing success regardless of what the number on the scale says. I, I even ask people like, if you can't let that attachment go, stop the daily weighing, stop the weekly weighing, just do it once a month. Because it really gives you such little information about your health. That's what it is. We often come in with the goal that I want to lose X number of pounds. Well, that's great. But what does losing X number of pounds do for you? 
Like, why do you want to do this? Well, okay, I want to feel better. Well, what does feel better mean? I want to, I want my clothes to feel comfortable on my body. I want to be able to bend and move and not feel all creaky when I wake up in the morning. I want to get up off the floor if I fall. I want to keep up with my kids or my grandkids. So we start to see from continuing to dig a little bit deeper from that, I want to lose X pounds, we start to see some very vulnerable places, but also those places where actionable steps happen. Because in all those things, we see nutrition, uh, cardiovascular endurance, strength, balance, stability, all things that even get broken down further into this is what you do today. Mm -hmm. And so we might achieve all of these things. You might be able to do all those things you listed out, feel amazing, and know that you're at the place that you envisioned being, and the scale may not have actually moved. But you have done incredible things to alter your health outcomes. And we often discount that because we attach the number to the scale. Yet what we've done is improved our quality of life. We have improved whatever health comes, health outcomes those were that we were looking at and have done so much more than just I've changed the number on the scale or the clothing size in my pants. Amen. Amen. I love that. And that goes into the next question I had for you, which is, I know that you work from your bio, you work from a weight neutral stance. Mm -hmm. Um, And I am loving everything that you say. And I I completely agree with all of that. But I want you to talk some about, um, about what a weight neutral stance is, what that means for your clients, how you work with them, and then how you balance in that accountability with it. um, So that way they feel successful in in whatever their goals are. Mm -hmm. So when we look at working from a weight neutral standpoint, not only is it what I just talked about in focusing on the actionable outcomes, but it's also that realization that not everyone's goal is weight loss. Yes. When somebody walks into a gym or walks into a nutrition coaching setting they may have no intention of losing weight, regardless of what their size is. And we sometimes forget that, that we assume someone in a larger body, well, okay, they're here to lose weight. No, they might not be. They might just actually be looking, how can I manage my blood sugar? How can I lower my blood pressure? How can I look at my cholesterol levels? How can I change these different outcomes? They didn't say anything about weight and you don't have to adjust your weight in order to have great impact on those things. So that that weight neutral place comes from what are your goals? How do we serve that in not pushing you into a place that you don't want to be? Because we all have different things, age, size, ability, our time our finances, so many things play into what we want to achieve. So when we take weight out of it, there's still a lot to work on. And that comes to that place of accountability again, because my job is to walk alongside you, not only guide you and help you along the way, but to help you see This is what you've achieved. This is the transformation. Remember, this is what you what you wanted. Now you've got it. And so really looking at the bigger picture beyond those metrics. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I totally agree. And yeah, I mean, going back to what you said about how not everybody's goal is weight loss. You know, I will say as a woman in her late 40s, that is something that I think a lot of the fitness industry forgets. Um, Because my experience in training and working with a lot of women over 40, what I hear more often than anything is, 
I don't care what the scale says. I just want to take care of myself and just having that shift. And I think that that is something that is missing in a lot of education for trainers, especially maybe younger ones. Um, And sometimes I don't want to throw all men under the bus, but you know, sometimes those male. And the other thing too, is depending on your culture of origin, you may have different visions of, of how you want your body to look. I mean, I was talking with a, a friend who's black and she said, yeah, I started running, but then I started losing my butt and I quit. <laughs> so like she didn't want to lose that. Um, and you know, that's just her particular story. But I think that it's really important to remember that for everyone, um, that yeah, not, not everybody's goal is weight loss. I love that. I love that. Um, one of the things that you uh, define yourself as is a body positive personal trainer. So talk mm-hmm. to us some about what that means. So again, it's bringing into that place of there's movement for everyone that age, size, ability, time, finances, those are the barriers that hold us back from movement. And so you might see yourself coming up against a wall, coming up against a wall, and not moving forward. But removing some of those barriers, sometimes does take that other person to help you see how you can go up, down, around, and get by it, so that you can achieve it. And it's not this Pollyanna thinking that anything is possible. Because anything really is possible. We might just not have the understanding in how to make it happen. But there are adaptations, there are modifications, there are a lot of things that we can do in breaking down movements or doing different types of movement that you are able to do that you enjoy because at the end of the day, movement has to be enjoyable. And when in that process of finding it is really understanding that your body is perfect in the time and space that you are in, in that exact moment, that we are inherently worthy just because of the fact we are breathing on God's green earth. So it's not about achieving a particular aesthetic. It's not about the before and after. It's about what can I do right now and continue to do moving on. That's, that's fantastic. I love that. If someone is listening and they're like, you know what, this is the person who I want to walk with me, who I want to have helped me talk to them about what they can expect um, if they were to partner with you in, in their health. Mm-hmm. Well, From a rudimentary standpoint, I work with movement, I work with nutrition, the marrying of the two, or either or. When someone comes to me, we're going to have a conversation about what it is you want, what it is that you need, and really, really kind of getting vulnerable pretty quick. Because I'm honest, I'm transparent, and in conversation, that tends to open people up too. Because at the end of the day, I know I'm not everyone's right fit. But it's understanding what your needs are, where we're going. So if I'm not your right fit, it's pulling open my referral network of trusted people of people I know that I can send you to in full confidence that they are going to meet your needs. Because we have to be in that place of I'm trusting myself with this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not everyone's right fit either. I, I, I completely respect that. And I think that knowing who you want to serve, and, um, and knowing that there are better fits with some people than others, I think does only helps the client, whether or not they turn into your client or not. Do you do so I know that you're based in Arizona, do you do virtual as well and in person? Yes, I am in person as well as virtual. I serve people through all the time zones in North America and a couple international. So, you know, if if the time works, we're good. Fantastic. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. I have two more questions that I ask all of my guests, uh, which are two very different questions. One is I am fascinated by tattoos. Don't ask me why I just am, but I have found 
that often when people are uh, decide to put body art on their body for the rest of their lives, they have a meaningful story behind it. So I was wondering if you had any tattoos, if you would mind sharing what it is uh, and the meaning behind it. And if you don't, if you had to get one, what would it be and where would it go? So I don't have it yet. Yes. But the one that I want is going to go on the inside of my wrist. I Now, I can't pronounce the Latin, so I'm not going to butcher it here. But it's the Latin translation for by endurance, we conquer. And that, that it, I mean, it, it's even up here on my computer monitor. And it's one of those quotes that came up early in my journey that has just always resonated with me not only from the endurance sports side, but just keeping the path that Mm -hmm. we continue daily to conquer the flesh and to be who God has created us to be. That's beautiful. I love that. That reminds me, I think it's the, I think it's Hebrews um, that talks about running you would you would know more than I would. I'm sure talking about running the full race and having the endurance to do it or something like that. So that I've never heard that. And I love it. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> and then um, do you have a meaningful Bible verse that you would like to share with my community? Yes. I love Deuteronomy six, five, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I love it because Its foundation is in the Old Testament, but it's repeated in the New Testament several times. That is that whole person, all that we are. When we are loving God with that whole person, we're growing, we're changing, we're in service exactly where we're meant to be. And it's also the base for the name of my business, Heart and Soul Fitness and Wellness. I mean, soul is spelled S O L E. Play on words. Got to get the got to get the sports in there. But that's where heart and soul came from. Is that that nod back to that foundation of who we are in Christ? That's beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I love how you talked about that's, yeah, the foundation is in the Old Testament, but it is repeated in the new and it just does bridge that. That's great. Okay, Stephanie, tell people how they can connect with you. So I am all over social media on some iteration of heart and soul fitness and wellness. Again, soul is S-O-L-E. Easiest place to find me, though, is my website, heart and soul, S O L E fit.com. And my blog is there, all my goodies. There's even that place to get on my calendar to have a conversation. Fantastic. Well, I would love for people to connect with you if they are needing that next step. Um, someone to partner, something one to provide accountability with on that journey. I just, I love what you're doing. I love, um, I just keep going back in my head to you talk about how you're changing who you are meant to serve. Um, just mm-hmm. that, that change from b- being a pastor to a health coach. And that, that is just really like reverberating in me. And so I, I love that. And, and thank you for sharing your story. I, there's so many other things that I feel like I could have gone into, but I just, I wish you the best. I think you're doing some great things and, um, and thanks for coming on today. Thank you. I love how Stephanie said, being in motion is my peace and joy. And I think she just gave words to how I feel about movement as well. But if that's not your story, I think she also makes movement and nutrition super sustainable, super realistic. And I just really appreciate that about Stephanie. Be sure to uh, check her out everywhere on the socials and especially at her website, heart and soul, S O L E fit.com. I'm sure she would love to connect with you. Now, I don't think I have said this in a while, but thank you for tuning in to this show. 
With over 2 million podcasts out there, I know you have a lot of options and a lot of people vying for your attention. I'm grateful you tuned in. Since this is free content to you, if you could leave a rating and a review, that would really help with getting the word out about this show to even more people who are ready for a grace-based perspective about their health. This grace-based or this graced health podcast is consistently in about the top 5% of all shows, but that's only with your help of leaving proof that it's valuable and sharing it with friends or on social media. So however you can support the show, thank you. Each episode, I'd like to leave you with one simple thing to remember because we cover a lot. And today's is It's these simple things we do that add up to big changes. And when we do those simple things like drinking more water, cooking at home, moving more, it also gives us an opportunity to grow in other areas like our spiritual life. And isn't that why we take care of ourselves in the first place? So we can do what we're called to do. I think so anyway, and I hope you do too. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a grace day.